Welcome to the strategic approach to the fellowship exam, the SAFE ICU course. My name is Arvind Rajamani. I am an intensivist working in the main hospital and I am the course convener. If you want to register for this course, you can contact me on rrarvind.hotmail.com. Now, SAFE is an exam, an ICU fellowship exam preparatory course. It started off uh, in 2009 as a written course which was exclusively focused on the written component of the fellowship exam and over the years it's changed into several different avatars before the, the current one. Last year in 2014 we expanded the scope of the course to include clinical hot cases and vivas but the difference between SAFE and a number of other courses is the amount of interaction that's available and the amount of specific feedback that's given to candidates who are not who are to registrants who are not sitting the current exams as well. For the 2015 course we've brought about really exciting changes. Virtually half the course is now full of workshops which are which are small group workshops. So what we've done is to dispense with the didactic teaching model of one presenter with 20 or 25 or 30 registrants sitting in a room and replace that with a very interactive closed small group workshop pattern. Now in order to cover the didactic uh, lectures as well we are taking the e-learning pathway so what you'll be seeing in the next few sections is um, our PowerPoint presentations by our faculty and kudos to our faculty for having done a brilliant job in, in, in putting these together. So you'll have all these lectures, you'll have to listen to all these lectures and see all these lectures and to make sure that you are, um, that you're paying attention we are going to have some pre-course MCQs or pre-course tests and then on the day of the course you will, you will have very little repetition from these lectures and what you'll have is a lot of application, a lot of examples, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of interactive uh, work uh, based on case studies. So please pay attention to each of these, uh, of these lectures. It's, they're very, very important. This is the only time you're going to be able to listen and you can listen to them as many times as, as you want. Do the pre-course MCQ and then come to the course well prepared. All the best. Hi, I'm Karen Costello from St. George Hospital in Sydney. Today's talk is Asset Based Part 2, The Steward Approach. Now, we have a choice. One can choose to be pragmatic and simply follow the steps of quantitative asset based analysis to produce answers to clinical problems that you will meet in your practice. And this is not unreasonable. Indeed, from the exam point of view, most fellowship questions are of the data interpretation variety. However, you need to be aware and be cautious because understanding the principles that underlie both traditional and steward approach are part of the Kikram curriculum. And indeed, the steward approach principles were asked in the first fellowship paper, 2014. But you have a more important choice to make. Ask yourself, do you want to make the investment in time to come to an understanding of what, of a tool that you use on a daily basis and a tool that is the most exquisite differentiator of critical illness or wellness, whichever the case may be. If you do wish such an, to seek such an understanding, you will need to make an investment in time. And Part of this talk, I'm going to ask you to read one article, look at three YouTube videos and listen to four podcasts. And I understand that this will take time and time is precious. I suggest that you spread this time out over several days to allow the concepts to sink in and embed. But this time investment will be worth it. I think you need to ask yourself, do you want to be an intensive care? physician that truly understands the tools that you use. So I'm going to begin with really a quick review of the traditional approach as outlined by Arvind Rajamani. 
And following that, I'm going to ask you to humor me, and I'm going to spend some time reviewing the very basic principles of physics and chemistry that I feel are important. Principles that we perhaps learned in high school and have subsequently forgotten. And I believe that because we've forgotten or have a limited understanding of the basic principles, we, we, we become frustrated when we approach articles or we approach videos or the, or the um, podcasts that I'm asking you to listen to. So bear with me. I hope that it makes sense. At the end of the talk, um, I'm going to refer you to Scott Weingart's EM Crit podcast for podcasts that he has come up really with a very simple ag algorithm but practical stepwise approach to acid base using the physicochemical approach. Let us review briefly the traditional, also known as the Henderson Hasselbach approach to acid base problems. If we strip away the negative logarithmic scale and remove the equilibrium coefficient derived from the law of mass ash action, we're left with the simple modified Henderson equation. And this argues that pH is directly a proportional to CO2 concentration, most typically expressed as a partial pressure, and is inversely proportional to serum bicarbonate levels. Disturbances in CO2 are described as being respiratory in origin, and disturbances in bicarbonate are described as being metabolic. Judgment as to the relative importance of each allows for a qualitative assessment as to the nature of disturbance. That is to say, an acidosis or an alkalosis can be described as being either respiratory or metabolic in origin. We can embellish our analysis through application of the so-called Boston rules that use formula of observed patterns of normal compensation, which if not present are deemed to be inadequate and highlight the possible presence of secondary acid-based disturbing processes at work. At best, we can describe this a semi-quantitative analysis. So if we follow the traditional stepwise approach to ABG interpretation as outlined by Arvind Regimani, pH measurement is followed really by a qualitative assessment differentiating respiratory from metabolic disturbance. This is embellished with a limited semi-quantitative assessment based on appropriateness of, of compensation. Finally, Laws of electro-neutrality, as well as some comparative osmolalities, are exploited with a view to narrowing down lists of differential diagnoses. Now, this model or approach has been hugely successful since it was first introduced in 1908 and subsequently modified. And it's lasted because it's useful, it's scientifically robust, and it's helped generations of clinicians and their patients. But there are limitations it fails to explain the pH disturbances that we frequently see in, in clinical practice, such as those caused by electrolyte or protein disturbance or severe changes in fluid volume. If we, for example, hypoventilate a patient, PCO2 will rise and pH will fall. But it is more often the case that minute ventilation responds to a metabolic acidosis. Therefore, PCO2 is both a dependent and independent factor in determination of body pH. Serum bicarbonate levels are almost always dependent factors with respect to pH. Think of it this way. If you have a problem, say acidosis, you can approach it by first examining the effects, that is to say the dependent factors, and working backwards as with the henderson hasselbrack approach or one can choose to examine all the potential causes and in doing so, quantify the contribution of each. This is what a quantitative approach to acid-base analysis seeks to do. Stewart's approach seeks to quantify the independent determinants of pH through analysis of the laws of physics and chemistry that are at play. If you want a full understanding, you may wish to read the second edition of Stewart's textbook edited by John Callum. It's a fantastic read and not as difficult as it looks. Let's begin then with the principles of physics and chemistry. So pH, as we use the term, really describes the concentration of the hydrogen ion. 
Normal concentration is 40, millimoles per, um, 40 nanomoles per litre, with a range typically between 20 and 100 nanomoles. But unfortunately, we use a negative logarithmic scale, and this makes understanding and teaching of the topic more complicated. So P refers to concentration. What about H? What is hydrogen? Well, it's the first element in the periodic table, and it consists really of a proton and an electron. There's no neutron, but in its ionic form, the electron is gone, leaving a proton. So pH, in effect, refers to the concentration of protons. It has an atomic mass of one and an atomic charge of one. It's a hadron, and that means that it's the smallest subatomic particle that can exist on its own in nature. Having the fundamental units of mass and charge, it must obey the laws of mass and charge. That's to say it must obey the laws such as concentration gradients, conservation of mass, the law of mass action, and with respect to charge, it must obey the law of electron neutrality, also known as Coulomb's law. Now, it's a highly reactive species. In fact, it's explosive. But its explosive nature and its ability to react uh, so violently is not what concerns us with respect to toxicity. What concerns us is that having such a small mass relative to its charge, it has what's called a very high charge density that creates a very large electric field around it, which affects neighboring molecules. In particular, it damages the macromolecular structure of proteins and enzymes, denaturing their activity. And that is why it's controlled and held in such small concentrations within the body. Let's discuss chemical bonds. Atoms unite to form molecules through the transfer of, of electrons. This can be a sharing arrangement, as in the case of molecular hydrogen, and is called covalent bonding. Ionic bonds, by contrast, involve the transfer of electrons, such as in the case of sodium and chloride. Each is seeking to arrange a stable arrangement of electrons in their outer valency shell. Sodium donates an electron to chloride, and in doing so, becomes positively charged or polar. The atoms then form a molecule of sodium chloride by virtue of the electrostatic forces of attraction between the two. This is ionic bonds. An important but often overlooked bond is the hydrogen bond. Here we see a water molecule. Two hydrogen atoms are uniting with an oxygen via covalent bonds to form H2O. However, by virtue of the larger proton mass of the oxygen nucleus, the electron, electron cloud is unevenly distributed, forming a polar molecule. As a consequence, weak bonds, hydrogen bonds, of mutual electrical attraction form between neighboring molecules. This occurs in a three-dimensional basis. Now, hydrogen bonds are incredibly important in acid base. If we dissolve a salt such as sodium chloride in water, and remember that's made up of sodium and chloride held together by ionic bonds, the individual atoms will be separated by virtue of hydrogen bonds that form with individual water molecules that surround them. Substances that completely dissociate in solution are known as strong ions. And they're defined by virtue of the fact that none of the parent substance remains in solution. This distinguishes them from weak electrolytes, which only partially dissociate in water. Molecules of the parent substance, as well as the products of, of dissolution, are both present in solution. Hydrogen bonds from water molecules are incredibly important with respect to pH. We need to realize that this interaction is a two-way process. The, hyd the hydrogen bonds impact from the water molecules impact on the substances dissolved within the water molecules, but equally there is a reverse effect. In particular, substances dissolved in, in water by virtue of hydrogen bonds affect the equilibrium or dissociation constant of water into its constituents of hydronium and hydroxyl ion. By that I mean Hydrogen bonds cause substances to dissolve in water, and this in turn affects the concentration of hydrogen ion within the water itself. 
In order to consider this further, we need to look not just at the type of bonds, but at the type of reactions that are at play. For molecules to react, they must first of all meet, or I should say collide. This is dependent on two factors. Firstly, their kinetic motion, which is a temperature-dependent factor, as well as the concentration of the reactants present. The rate of reaction between substances is described by the law of mass action. And this states that the rate of reaction is constant at, a, at standardized temperature, typically 25 degrees centigrade, and is proportional to the product of the concentration of reactants present. The rate of reaction or rate constant, K, can be very large, such as the case of hydrogen combining with oxygen. This is an example of an irreversible reaction. Irreversible reactions have the feature of the release of a large amount of free energy that is available to do useful work, so-called Gibbs free energy. However, what interests us in biology are reversible reactions, which occur in both directions and involve the non-release non of Gibbs free energy that is available to do useful work. In this case, the reaction occurs in two directions and there are two rate constants. Eventually, the concentrations on either side of the equation line up, such that an equilibrium is achieved where K1 is equal to K2. An important example of this reaction is the dissociation of water into the hydroxyl and the hydronium ion. Equilibrium constants can be derived through combining the rate equations for the reactions occurring in either direction. We have met this before. This is the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, which is merely the law of mass action and equilibrium constants being applied to the reversible dissociation of bicarbonate and carbon dioxide. Now, I'd like you to look at the first video on YouTube. Link is provided below. It goes into depth as to the background behind rate constants, equilibrium constants and how they're derived. I think it's important to invest some time in this as rate constants, in particular the rate constants and equilibrium constants of the separation of water into hydronium and hydroxyl ions um, and adjustments in this rate constant when uh, compounds are dissolved in it, such as strong ions or weak ions, really is a theoretical basis as to why pH adjusts when we dissolve salts. Let us consider for a moment what defines an acid. The best known definition is that provided by Bronsted and Lowry, which describes an acid as a proton donor and a base as a proton receptor. This definition holds well for, say, hydrochloric acid or indeed for carbon dioxide dissolving in water to form carbonic acid and in turn dissociating to increase hydrogen ion concentration. However, if we consider dissolving sodium chloride in water, um, the definition does not explain the fall in pH that's observed. For that, we would need a different definition of, of an acid. In fact, an older definition as provided by Sven Arrhenius, which, who described an acid as a substance which increases hydrogen ion concentration when it dissociates in water. Different approaches to analysis of acid-base problems use different definitions for defining what an acid is. The traditional approach relies on the Bronsted-Lowry definition, and the Stewart approach uses that by Arrhenius. We should not get hung up on this discrepancy. We need to realise that definitions describe or organise categories of data. They are not laws of physics or chemistry that need to be obeyed. Finally, the law of electroneutrality, or Coulomb's law. It argues that very large forces come into play if charge separation occurs within a sample volume. Take, for example, a one millimeter diameter sphere with a positive charge excess of one multiplied by 10 to the power of minus seven. 
This would require a potential difference of 400,000 volts to maintain that separation. It's not that separation of charge cannot occur, it's simply by virtue of the extent of forces required that it does not occur. And we can exploit this. We know that within any given sample volume, say for example the intracellular compartment or the extracellular compartment of fluid, that the, the total positive charge will equal the total negative charge. If we know the extent of the positive charge and we can measure the components of the negative charge, any discrepancy can be accounted for by unmeasured anions. This highlights us to the presence of species of anions that may otherwise have gone undetected. The electroneutrality equation argues that the sum of all cations, sodium, potassium and hydrogen ion, in the left-hand column must equal that of all anions in the right-hand column. Any discrepancy represents an unmeasured ion. This form of graph is known as a gambellogram. And we exploit this principle in both the traditional approach in the form of the anion gap and in the Stewart approach in respect to the strong ion difference. Okay, enough basic problems. So what constitutes the Stewart approach to clinical acid-base problem interpretation? It rejects the central role given to the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffering system and treats these as dependent, not independent factors in the determination of pH. It relies on Arrhenius' definition of an acid as a substance that increases hydrogen ion concentration when it dissociates in water. In fact, water is central. If you do anything to water, you will alter pH. If you change its temperature, if you dissolve strong ions, if you dissolve weak ions, or if you dissolve carbon dioxide, you will, you will alter pH. Peter Stewart was able to show that the concentration of six dependent variables, most importantly the hydrogen ion concentration, which is what interests us, could be accurately predicted through the simultaneous application of six laws based on the laws of mass action, conservation of mass and conservation of charge, which you combined into a single equation using complex mathematics known as the Stewart equation. And within this equation are, are embedded are three dependent variables. That's a rather complicated way of that is a rather complicated way of saying that pH is dependent on strong ion difference, atote, that's concentration of non-volatile weak acids in their ionic form, and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. All other variables in the equation are constants, mostly equilibrium constants. So Stewart's approach seems to quantify the relative contribution of each of the three dependent factors. Strong ion difference is the numerical difference in concentration between strong anions and cations. It does not depend on what the individual ions are. A tote represents the ionic concentration of non-volatile weak acids. And relative to human biology, this is taken as a ionic corrected fact concentration of albumin. PCO2 and its dissociation into carbonic acid has already been explained. The second video uh, that I'd like you to look at, the link is below, is by Eric Strong. It's a fantastic presentation on all the theories of acid base from a historical perspective, beginning with Henderson Hasselbach and working through to Stewart. It will explain in quite some detail uh, the meaning and importance of terms such as strong ion difference, atote, and will also introduce the concept of buffer bases and basic SAS. So before mo moving on to the third video, I suggest that perhaps you consider taking a break, perhaps overnight, to allow time for the concepts to sink in. This video is over an hour long and it's by Edward Omron and MD. It will reinforce the important principles that we need to understand, but it will also provide excellent examples with good graphics as to what happens uh, with respect to changes in buffer base in response to 
alterations and strong eye indifference. In other words, it provides, it will give good examples of various situations that we meet in clinical practice and how these can be interpreted from a quantitative approach. So is there a stepwise approach that we can employ to ABG interpretation using Stewart rather than the traditional approach? Well, the answer is yes, there are, but unfortunately there are many of them. Being a newer system, there isn't universal agreement as to the precise steps, the precise definitions or the precise calculations. For example, in the talk that you just saw by Dr. Amon, you may have noticed that strong line difference was calculated as being equal to the buffer base. Other authors would have used the term the effective strong line difference for this term. So there are choices to be made. For example, when calculating strong line difference, will we simply subtract chloride concentration from sodium or will we include the other cations, potassium, magnesium and calcium? That's to say, should we choose complexity and accuracy over simplicity, ease of use at the bedside? Now, multiple protocols have been developed, and I'm going to refer you to the protocol developed by Scott Weingart in his EM Crit podcast series. There are four podcasts, here's the link, dealing with acid base. The first one, number podcast 44, deals with, really reviews the theory of acid base in a much more brief format than what you've already, we've already gone through. 45 outlines a stepwise, simple, robust mathematical approach to dealing with acid base clinical problems. Podcast 46 really does some clinical exam goes works through some examples, and podcast 50 discusses how quantitative theory can guide the choice of fluid resuscitation. The stepwise protocol outlined is very simple. One simply takes bloods, measures pH, assess the contribution of partial pressure of carbon dioxide using the Boston rules if you choose to. Strong line difference is calculated using the simple formula of sodium minus chloride. This could perhaps be better called the chloride effect and you know one would need to consider making compensations in the case of hypo or hyperkalemia. Metabolic acidosis is defined according to an abnormal strong ion gap that's to say if it's greater than positive or negative two millimoles and in turn is calculated using standard base effect chloride effect lactate and the effect of albumin. The four podcasts work you through the steps involved in a simplistic and logical fashion. And I'm not going to, at this stage, work through clinical examples with you. Instead, I look forward to meeting you in Nepean and where we will use the opportunity to uh, work through different clinical problems using different approaches to acid base analysis. I hope you'll see that both approaches uh, are highly effective they do not contradict each other, as you may read in other literature. Uh, in fact, they are approaching the same problem from different directions. For those of you who are looking for a review article on the mathematics as to how Stuart derived his three dependent variables, I'd recommend the following article by Howard Covey. It, it's an excellent um, article in that it strikes a great balance between simplicity and complexity. Certainly I was able to follow it and I found it very useful. Thanks for listening and uh, I look forward to meeting you shortly.